It is my pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Bronwyn Williams. Dr. Williams is an assistant professor of environmental science at the Claremont Colleges. Bronwyn is a Canadian transplant who now calls California home. She holds a bachelor's degree in marine and freshwater biology from the University of Guelph, a master's degree in biology from the University of Quebec, and a PhD in geology from Ohio State University. She is an oceanographer who uses the skeletons of marine organisms as tools to understand recent changes in the climate. She has worked throughout the world's oceans from the tropics to the poles, focusing primarily on extracting records of oceanograph oceanic and atmospheric change from the skeletons of coralline algae and corals. The title of tonight's talk is Arctic Climate as Documented by Algal Rocks. Please help me welcome Dr. Bronwyn Williams. Good evening. Thank you for uh, coming to spend your Friday evening with me. I'm delighted to be here. So I thought I would break this lecture up into three different parts. The first part is I wanted to give you a bit of introduction into who I am as a scientist and how I ended up on this stage um, speaking to you about climate change. And then I'm going to spend two thirds of my talk talking about two of my projects. One that I've recently completed, um, came, was published earlier this year, and then one that's very much in progress. And I won't come back to this picture until that final part of tonight's lecture, but I will tell you I'm actually standing on top of a couple hundred meters of ocean water uh, in July. Um, I was up in the high Arctic in Canada, and I'm standing on sea ice um, that was melting pretty quick as we were going into the summer season. So I am Canadian, uh, and if you listen carefully, you might hear some of my vowels, and I do throw the word A in there, uh, particularly if you get going with the questions at the end. I grew up just outside of Toronto in a suburb at the end of the commuter rail. Um, and if you notice, uh, Toronto, my, marked by my little yellow dot there, is really nowhere near the ocean. And it wasn't until I was uh, 10 years old, and my parents put us in the car, and we drove 24 hours straight through down to Florida, and I got out, and I saw the ocean for the first time, and I fell in love. I fell in love with the ocean, and stereotypically, I fell in love with the charismatic megafauna, the dolphins. <laughs> so um, one thing to point out is that um, I'm standing in the ocean here. It's March, and I think only the Canadians were really in the water <laughs> because all the locals thought we were crazy. <laughs> so you can fast forward, I think, about seven or eight years after this, and I did my degree in marine and freshwater biology at the University of Guelph in Ontario, and I've met somebody tonight who also did his degree in um, University of Guelph. Uh, and it's also um, outside of Toronto and nowhere near the ocean. But I was fortunate to have amazing summer experiences where I was able to go out and do research. So for my first summer, I went out to New Brunswick and I did a summer semester, really intensive. Um, we did three courses over about two months in an independent research project. It was a small class, um, lots of um, time to spend with the professors. Uh, it was also in the part of the world with the highest tidal range. So what that means is when the tide comes in, the water level comes up, and, and then when, when the tide goes out, the water comes down, and the change is about a story or two in height. So massive changes in tides. And there I fell in love with research. I realized that um, through research, we can satisfy my curiosity by using logic and information. So I realized I still loved the ocean, and I really loved research, and that set me on my career trajectory. From there, the following summer, I went down to Chesapeake Bay, and I did an internship at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center studying crabs, of all things. Uh, blue crabs, I think it's either the official or unofficial and food of Maryland, um, are doing really well, but there's a competitive crab, the green crab, and they were really worried that the green crab was gonna outcompete the blue crab. So I was part of a bigger project studying the crab ecology. The following summer, I went out to the west coast, as I said, I had to get all my ocean time in in the summer. And I did an uh, internship at Oregon State University going back into the intertidal zone. And over the course of a summer, I was able to go from just north of Point Conception, so north of Santa Barbara, and work my way all the way up the west coast to the northern tip of Washington State. And we were exploring the intertidal ecology. So again, that range on the shore between high tide, where it's submerged in water, and then low tide, where it's exposed, and we were documenting the diversity and the biomass of organisms. Now, what I learned over these three summers was I was definitely an ocean person, and I loved research, but something wasn't quite kind of jiving with me in terms of the research questions and how we answered them. And part of my goal in starting my degree was to kind of save the dolphins. Again, kind of stereotypical. I kind of fell in love with starfish, though, once I got into the intertidal zone. 
And I realized that if we wanted to save the dolphins or the starfish or any of the marine life, we need to study the organisms. We need to in study the interactions of the organisms with people. But really what matters is their environment. If the environment around those organisms is not healthy, then it doesn't matter what we do in terms of the organisms themselves. So I kind of took a step back from being a marine biologist and kind of started thinking about our environment and becoming an environmental scientist. With the idea is that we needed to have a healthy environment to have healthy things living in it. The other thing that I realized through my research experience was that it took a lot of time to get all the information that we needed to address these research questions. And again, that was a lot of work and you couldn't really get to those big questions kind of fast enough for my, my curiosity. So I learned about this field of science called paleo-oceanography. I started working with a professor at a different university called McMaster University. And he taught me that instead of us going out to get the information from the environment, instead, we can collect materials from the ocean that have been there for a long time, and they've been doing all the work collecting the information. And then we can get that information from them. And then when I learned this, I fell off my chair, had my eureka moment, and realized this is what I'm supposed to do. So then in addition to being a marine biologist, an environmental scientist, I became a paleo-oceanographer and an earth scientist. And I really started studying how has the environment changed recently, but also into the past. And so during this process, um, I went and did uh, my first uh, graduate degree at the University of Quebec and Montreal. I started as a not really a French speaker, and I finished not really a French speaker, but it is in <laughs> fact a French university. Um, and I started a research project looking at deep sea corals in the Gulf of Mexico. And I was tracing humans' impact on the chemistry of the seawater. What I found, and as the first person to show this, is that land use, so the way that we are using our land in the Mississippi watershed is actually draining out into the Gulf of Mexico. It's sinking down into the deep ocean and it's being taken up by these corals in the Gulf of Mexico. And the specific thing that I found was terrestrial effluent. And that's a really polite way of saying sewage from people and from animals. So what I found was the chemical signature in nitrogen, the, the um, element nitrogen, recorded in these deep sea corals. So people were impacting the deep ocean. And then I started my PhD. I went, came down to the States for that, to Ohio State University. And I was continuing this work with these corals. And what I started thinking about then was, well, if we want to think about humans are impacting the environment, what I had found so far was really a regional impact. So an analogy would be if I have my car sitting on my driveway right now, and it's dripping oil, and there is rain. Hard to imagine rain at this time of year. But if you think about all winter, when we did actually have quite a bit of rain, and that water washes out to the ocean, and the oil from my driveway ends up in the ocean. But the carbon dioxide that I'm emitting from my car when I drive it is going up into the atmosphere. And the impact is not local, it's not regional, it's global. And I stepped back again in the way I thought about my research and realized that I'm interested in global environmental change. And the single biggest way that we are causing our environment to change is because of carbon dioxide. So then I became a climate scientist as well. And while I was doing my grad degree and I realized that really we are changing the climate, um, and this is actually a big deal, uh, I wasn't the only one kind of coming to this realization. I didn't start off as a climate scientist. I didn't go looking for this problem or this information. It's when I started looking at what was in front of me, I realized this is what's going on. Now people have been doing this for decades. I finally caught up to the party. Um, I've been now thinking about it probably for about 15 years. But when you ask climate scientists, are people changing our climate? The answer is about, yeah, 97% of the time. Now, sometimes in the media, they like to have a person who supports something and the person against it, because it makes a really good news story to have both sides of the opinion. So there's been a lot of effort over the past 10 years or so in trying to find out people who think about this, who think about climate, do they think, based on the research, that people are changing the climate and you can see here, there's a pretty strong consensus. Between 91 and 100% of the scientists studied in seven different studies over the past decade all show the consensus that there's scientific agreement on human-caused global warming. So this realization that I came to on my own was actually fairly consistent with the scientific community. The other thing that's kind of come up more recently is that it kind of sucks. So this was published in CNN earlier this week. 
Um, a grim conclusion on climate, um, a couple new studies came out. They show by the year 2100, we're going to have massive extinctions and super droughts. There's going to be higher sea level. Um, so there's some things that are going to happen in our environment that are going to look fundamentally different than it is today because of climate. We also know that it's a very political thing in our field, and sometimes celebrities have stuff to say about it. But what <laughs> I'm going to end this talk on, again, kind of foreshadowing where I'm going, is that I'm actually really optimistic, despite the fact that I know people are changing our climate and that it could be very severe in consequences. So don't worry, this is the only time I'm going to kind of give you the bad news. The rest of the time we're going to talk about some of the good stuff. Something to think about though with is even though I came to this realization about 10 or 15 years ago, and there are people who've been studying this for a couple decades before that, the first time that somebody a scientist first put out there the impact of carbon dioxide on our climate was over 150 years ago. So if you can look up into the year of this, it's 1856. This is a screenshot of the original publication, so my apologies, it's a bit blurry. And this was given by a female scientist, read before the American Association, and this is a screenshot from a couple sentences from her two-page paper. Now, because she was a female scientist, as typically happens, she gets pushed out of the way, and somebody else gets credit for first talking about it a couple years later. But I thought I wanted to highlight this tonight because it gives you an example that this is not new science. The science has been around for kind of a long time. And what she reports, she did a series of experiments um, looking at the way that the sun's rays, light from the sun, um, the impact of temperature from the energy from the sun, and what she found down here is that carbonic acid gas, which I would call carbon dioxide, has the highest effect on the temperature from the sun's rays. So this is not new science. The science has been around for a very long time. And so when we think about the science, and now we come to this invest the realization about people's impact on climate, we can think about it that it comes from all these different disciplines. So my background was, if I can trace you back through it, I thought about it in terms of marine biology, and then environmental science, and then earth system science, and then climate science. But people have come to that realization through physics, astronomy, geology. So from all these different disciplines studying different aspects of the question from the research have all converged in understanding what is going on. And one of those is computer modelers. And I really think that, that computer modeling is vital to the progress we're making in this field. When I think about computer model, a lot of times people think about kind of their little laptop on their desktop. But this is what I'm talking about with the supercomputers when I'm talking about computer models. And this is one of the ones with NASA. And there's several stations throughout the US and throughout the world where they have these supercomputers that run climate models. So what's a climate model? A climate model is when you can take mathematical equations to represent something physical in our environment. And I'll give you an example of some of the data that a climate model can produce. But basically, it's taking something that happens in the environment and turning it into math. And what we can do then is you can, you can take all those equations and you can start to simulate or create a model using your computer, hence the name, to simulate what's happening in the environment. And we have very complex global climate models now that can model or they can kind of replicate or produce the processes that are occurring in our actual world. The advantage of the computer model is that you can change something. It's really, really difficult for us to change how much sunlight's coming onto our planet, right? It's impossible. Computer model, you can just change it a little bit up or down and you can see what the impact is. So computer models are really critical for us to understand how our climate is changing. And here's an example that I think illustrates this really well. This is a um, series of data. This is our instrumental data measured by thermometer going from left to right from 1880 to 2014. Up is warmer temperatures. It's up to 2 degrees Fahrenheit. And down is cooler temperatures down to 2 degrees Fahrenheit. So these are our actual observed temperatures over about the past 140 years or so. So this was measured. Using a computer model, what scientists have done is they have taken the different factors that can cause temperature to change on our planet. And they did this first. What I'm going to show you first is the natural factors that cause climate to change. They ran their model. And what I'm going to show you is how temperature changes if you only include those factors that change climate naturally. 
So those three factors, orbital changes, solar, and volcanic activity. Orbital changes, what's that? Well, it's really cool. The sun um, is up here, our Earth is here. The way the Earth moves around the sun actually varies over time. Both the shape of the ellipse around the sun, the tilt, so if we're tilted more towards it or less towards it, and then also the Earth is kind of like a top and it wobbles, and that wobble changes over time. And all those three, three things change how much of the sun's energy hits our planet. Now they tend to change on really long time scales, so it's really not relevant for our discussion of the past, the recent past changes in temperature. The strength of the sun, solar variability, does change. It changes on the time scales that we're talking about here. And when I say time scales, I mean over the past 150 years or so. And so this model output here, by output, it's the data that the model generates, will take into account all the variability in the sun's activity and the amount of energy we receive from the sun since 1880. Then we also have volcanic activity. And you can see these real sudden drops. Those are volcanic events. There tend to be tropical volcanic events that tend to be very big. And what those volcanoes do is they put particles, soot, sulfur, up into the atmosphere. And that sulfur actually blocks some of the sun from coming into our planet. And it cools the planet for a year. What happens to that soot after a little while? It slowly settles down into the atmosphere. And temperatures warm back up to where they were before as well. So if we think about it, the natural factors that cause temperature to change are orbital changes, our solar variability and our volcanic variability, we can take model temperature or how temperature would change, and we can see how well that compares to the actual measured change in temperature. What do you think? Not at all, right? So let's think now about what humans are doing. There are four ways that humans primarily can change temperature. The first one, the top one, is our greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases were putting carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. For example, this carbon dioxide, right now, the carbon dioxide has been traditionally been trapped underground in the form of fossil fuels. It's oil, natural gas, coal, it, um, from dead organisms that died tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years ago, and then decomposed over time, kind of what you're talking about, um, under a lot of pressure because of all the rocks on top of it. But we're taking that carbon that's lost into the ground, we're burning it for energy, and we're putting it into the atmosphere. And it works as a blanket in our atmosphere. The sun's energy can come through the greenhouse gases, but when it is trying to leave our planet, it gets trapped. So it's like a blanket over our planet that lets the sun's rays in, but it doesn't let the energy be radiated out from the Earth out of the atmosphere. So it keeps the energy in the system, and it warms the system up. And if we only had greenhouse gases changing the temperature of our planet, it would actually have warmed it more than what we see. So why is that? Well, there's other things we're doing to change temperature as well. One of them is ozone. I don't know if the ozone layer, it's getting smaller a little bit. That's what we're covering. This is a new story. The ozone hole is slowly going to start getting smaller again soon. Um, but it was growing for a long time because there's other things we're putting in the atmosphere. And it let a little bit more of the sun's energy in, and it caused a little bit of a warming over time. We're also changing what the surface of our planet looks like. Land use and this is a really interesting one. If you think about our tropical forests, and if you were thinking if you were in space looking down at the tropical forests, they're a really dark, rich green. And we're cutting down these forests, and then it's being replaced with kind of desert or kind of bare, lighter brown colors. And that color ends up being really important. It's a process called albedo. Really light colors reflect the sun's energy and keeps it cool. Dark colors absorbs the sun's energy and warms it up. And the easiest way for you to think about that is when it's a really hot day outside and you've just been swimming in your pool and you're running to the car or to your house, wherever you're going, and you forgot your shoes and you run on the white path, not on the black. And that's primarily because of the color. So white reflects and it keeps it cool, black absorbs. So as you cut down or deforest, we're going through a massive deforestation, you're changing the color and you're actually reflecting more of the sun's energy, causing a cooling. The final thing that humans are doing on a big scale to change climate is we are putting aerosols into the atmosphere. 
So the same way the volcanoes put aerosols into the atmosphere, again, that's our soot, our sulfur, our particles, cars and other combustion engines also put it into the atmosphere. And the same way the volcanic activity, putting the soot in the atmosphere caused a bit of a cooling because it reduces some of the sun's energy coming into our system, so does the aerosols. Now, that might seem good because maybe it's offsetting greenhouse gas, but I'm sure all of you who've lived in Los Angeles for a long time know that's also air pollution, which is bad for our health, it can cause asthma. And Los Angeles is a great example of how policy can be effective in cleaning up air pollution. So what we can do is we can take all these variables, we can take our three natural ones, our four human-caused ones, and with the power of the computer model, we can put them all together, and how do you think it's gonna do when we look at what, what our model temperature is gonna be? We can actually reproduce the observed temperature really well. So this is just one line of evidence. I teach an entire course about climate change. It takes me about two months just to get through all the understanding of our climate. So it's one line of evidence, but to show how well we understand the climate and then how well we can replicate what is causing it to change. Now, another powerful thing about models is I've tried really hard and I've yet to be able to figure out how to go into the future to see how everything ends up. But with models, we can do that. We can actually project into the future to see what temperature might look like. Now, the hard part is we have no way to test it other than to sit around and wait, but still, it's information, and information is always valuable. So this is climate model projection. On the left, we're going from 1950 to just after 2000, and that black line is the same black line of the temperature that I just showed you. And then we're gonna project into the future into the year 2100. Now 2100 seems kind of far away. I don't know about how many of you all, but I'm pretty sure I'm gonna be gone by then. But I got two little kids. They're this high and this high. They're pretty awesome. And they'll still be around, I hope, then. So 2100 is not really that far away, in fact. Um, it's the next generation. They'll still be alive. So it's, it's, it seems far away, but it's not so far away. And what you can see with these projections of, super, of future, um, of how it's going to change, there's four different kind of boxes at the end here. But I'm going to focus on the top one, the red one, and the bottom one, the blue one. What these are is different scenarios of how our global society could progress. So it's thinking about the um, economy, it's thinking about development, it's thinking about population, it's thinking about globalization. And it's different pathways of how the future might occur and how that's gonna impact carbon dioxide. And then what this is modeling from that is how that concentration of carbon dioxide will determine temperature. So if we look first at the red one right up here, this is, and this is a little bit of bad news, I'm sorry, this is business as usual. This is if we make no changes. This is not some um, out there scenario of you know, what could happen in doomsday. This is the pathway we're on. Four degrees warming on average relative to the recent past. The good news is this one is if we get our act together, we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and we can actually curtail most of the warning, warming. So we're on average only about one degree warmer than we have been in the recent past. So the power of models is it lets us see into the future. What I want to focus on, though, and where I'm going to kind of go with the rest of my talk, is what this, these um, projections are. If you can see how it's a bold area in the middle and there's a big shaded area, it's actually a lot of models all run together and taking the results from all those models. But it's a pretty big shaded area. So the, all the models from all the different groups around the world that have projected global temperature, they're all a little bit different and they all give you a little bit different answer. So why are they different? Well, there's still a lot we don't know about climate. How do you make the models better? Well, you have to test them and you have to validate them. One way to validate them is to use data. And that's where I come in. I know data is boring to most people, but I just, it's amazing, it's fantastic. So how do we get data? Well, since 1979, we got so much data. If you have anybody who's looking for what career to go into, big data. There's so much data out there, we don't have enough people trying to figure out what to get out of it. Satellites were an amazing invention. They've been collecting data. Um, since 1979, we're in really good shape. But 1979 is not that long ago. So what did we do before then? 
I'm going to give you one example. We're going to go from space now into the ocean, because of course, oceanographer up here. This is the location and density of temperature measurements in the ocean, in the surface ocean, for the 20-year period from 1980 to 1999. The color scheme goes from dark purple is when all of the months in that 20-year period had a measurement by thermometer of sea surface temperature. White is when there was no measurements of sea surface temperature over that 20-year period. So a couple things might pop out to you. Some parts of the oceans, we have a lot of data. That's great. Some parts of the oceans, we have no data. And those are your white bands just north of Antarctica and then along the Arctic, the top and the bottom. The other thing, and I love it when science and kind of cultural um, development coincide, can you see kind of how there's tracks in the ocean? Those are called ships of opportunity, and that's when we have had transport ships who take those measurements. And so that actually shows you the development of shipping routes. Those are major shipping routes in the ocean. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back in these 20-year windows in time to show you how the amount of data we have in the oceans has changed in the past. And you can probably guess it's going to decrease. We're going to see more white and less purple. So here's 1960 to 1979, 1940 to 1959, 1920 to 1939, 1900 to 1919, 1880 to 1899. So as we go further back in the past, we have much fewer observations. We go back to my final um, time slide here of 1860 to 1879. We have almost no observations throughout the entire Pacific Ocean. So we do have data going back to 1860, but we don't have a lot of data. And there's nothing before 1860. So how do we get data? And this is where my field comes in. We use tools. And if you had heard Julie's introduction to me at the beginning, she talks about how I use these tools to get information. And I'm going to go back up onto land to give you an example, because I think this is most accessible to people, is trees, because we're all seeing trees, right? So you take a tree, you cut it down, and you look at it. And some trees have growth rings in them. And those growth rings in some trees form every year. So if you know when you cut the tree down, you can actually count time in those rings. And I've actually done this with a preschool class, so it's pretty, you know, it's an accessible idea. You can actually assign time. If it was collected or cut down or however you harvested in 2004, you can count back 2003, 2002, 2001, all the way back. And have you ever been at one of the parks or national forests and you've seen those really big trees? Some of them go back about 2,000 years of growth. Now some trees, um, Canada for example, where it tends to be a little bit colder than here, the trees get stressed by temperature. So if temperatures are warmer, the tree's happier, it's going to grow more, and that growth ring is actually going to be a bit wider where if it's a cooler year, the tree's not quite as happy, it's going to grow a little bit less, and that growth ring might be a little bit narrower. And what people can do, scientists can do, is they measure the width of those rings over the lifespan of the tree, and they can use it to see how temperature has changed in the past. And this is actually how we know how much of northern hemisphere temperature has changed over the past 2,000 years, is from the properties of trees. Now, trees are great, we've all seen them, but again, oceanographers, so I do it in the ocean with corals. And this top coral, this pink-purple coral, was collected from off the Channel Islands from a couple hundred meters deep. And from some of these corals, when you cut them and look them at the trunk, they have growth rings, just like trees do. Now, their growth is a bit more complicated, but um, you can still find time in them the same way you do with trees. And these corals have been feeding on stuff in the water for example, some of the particles that have come from land into the ocean in the Gulf of Mexico, and they've been capturing that into their skeleton, and they've been documenting changes in the oceans over their lifespan. And some of these corals, not these ones, these ones only grow for maybe 100 years, but off the coast of Hawaii can grow for several thousands of years. But what I'm here to talk to you about today are these things, my algal rocks. These are plants. So this is a plant right here. And I'm, again, geologist, so I have the rock hammer for scale. These are plants that grow in the temperate, subarctic, and arctic regions in the northern hemisphere. And they grow this rock-like skeleton. And if you were to cut them the same way you do with the tree or with the coral, they actually have growth bands in their skeleton, the same way these other organisms do. So we can find time in these algae. They're, we call them encrusting coralline algae. 
Um, often um, people will mistakenly call them corals, or and they ask me about these green fleshy things, but they kind of look like rocks. They're called coral and algae. And if anybody here scuba dives or goes snorkeling and you see that pink cover on the rocks, coral and algae are everywhere, but they're a little bit not as well known or not as well appreciated. Um, so we're trying to bring them to everybody's attention, how amazing these plants are. Because, like the corals and the trees, they can also live for a very long time. This specimen here, it didn't grow continuously for the whole time, but the base of the skeleton, part of that actually grew 850 years ago. So part of this plant grew almost 1,000 years ago, 850 years ago. So they can grow for a very, very long time. The other thing that's really cool about this plant, and the specific genus, the taxa, for any of the biologists out there that I study, is called Plathromorphum, and there's two species that we look at. It is found throughout this kind of high latitude region that if you remember back to my slide of all those seawater temperature data, that was that white band around the Arctic, where we have no data really prior to kind of 1979. So it's one of those big areas of the world that we don't really know how temperature has changed in the past. So this algae is an amazing source of information that can tell us about how temperature in the seawater has changed. It's a plant, so it grows in the seawater on the seafloor, but it needs light for photosynthesis. So typically it's within scuba diving depths. Again, because we're geologists, we go down with our chisel and our rock hammer and we're like hammering away at it underwater to collect it and bring it up. And then it kind of does look like a rock when it's out of the water, um, like this. And it has a skeleton that is formed of calcium carbonate. So calcium, carbonate, carbonate is carbon, and then three oxygens. And the skeleton's really amazing because it's a calcium carbonate crystal. But it can sometimes, you can take magnesium, and you can substitute magnesium. So you can take the calcium out and put magnesium in instead. So it's then magnesium carbonate. So calcium carbonate is most of the skeleton. Every once in a while, you get magnesium instead of the calcium, and it becomes magnesium calcium. But the rate at which that occurs, the frequency which when magnesium takes out calcium, responds to temperature. So when it's warmer, you actually get more magnesium substituting in the place of calcium. And when it's cooler, you get less. So what I can show you here is gridded SST. Gridded SST is our seawater temperature data. And the database that I used for this plot is called ERSST, and it's put out by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, so a national government agency, um, put out the ERSST data set. And then algal magnesium calcium is the magnesium calcium that I measured in the algae. And you can see that they go up and down together. This is from 1990 to 2000. So winter, there's less magnesium. Summer, temperatures go up. There's more magnesium, and down and up. So what this is, magnesium calcium in this, um, this plant that grows in the ocean is actually a paleothermometer proxy. What does that mean? It means it has been measuring temperature for us. Not directly, it's a proxy, so it's been measuring magnesium calcium which tells us about temperature. But it's a paleothermometer. We can use it to understand what temperature has been in the past. So this is one of the tools that I use to understand past climate in our oceans. So for this specific project that I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to talk about um, specific location in the North Pacific Ocean. So here's the North Pacific Ocean. I'm not biased, but it's by far the best ocean. There's the Bering Sea up here. And what we're looking at is chlorophyll A, where the red colors is more chlorophyll A, and the bluer colors is less chlorophyll A. The um, garbage patch that we heard about earlier is kind of in the middle here because of the ocean circulation um, around this ocean basin. The reason why I'm showing you chlorophyll A is that this location is important, in my mind, for two reasons. The first reason, there's a lot of nutrients in the northern North Pacific Ocean and in the Bering Sea. Nutrients, and we're using chlorophyll A as kind of a measure of how much nutrients there are. It's a measure of primary productivity, which reflects nutrients. Why are nutrients important? Well, in the ocean, if you have a lot of nutrients, you can support a lot of ocean life. We're very fortunate off the coast of California, um, if anyone's been up to Monterey Bay, there's a lot of deep water that comes up to the surface. That deep water brings up nutrients, and it supports a lot of life. There's a lot of biomass, there's a lot of animals that live there, um, a lot of diversity. 
And if you go further up, you get even more nutrients up in the Aleutian Archipelago. The Aleutian Archipelago is that island line that kind of traces the top of the North Pacific Ocean, right along here. This supports a lot of economic fisheries, so that it um, both provides support um, financially for a lot of communities, and it also provides protein for a lot of people, those fisheries. So we want to understand how the fisheries are going to change with changing temperatures. The other reason this location is really important is a little bit more selfish for us is because our winter precipitation comes from storms that come across the Pacific Ocean. So when we have storms, the winter storms, they come across like this. What brings them across? Well, in part, it's seawater temperature. So understanding seawater temperature in this region is important economically, it's important culturally, and it's important climatically, and it can impact us. So for this project, what I did is I used specimens the oldest one that I was able to get good data from was about 350 years. And they're plants. Um, we're people. If you look around, we all look differently. So I didn't just measure from one of the algae. I actually measured about 14 different plants. I measured the magnesium calcium over the lifespan of each of those plants. And then I combined it together to make a record of temperature where I had my paleo temperature, so what the temperature was in the past, but really importantly, I also had a band of uncertainty, or how confident was I in that number? So this is my plot, and what I'm showing you here, the y-axis is my reconstructed seawater temperature. So this is temperature, again, derived from the skeleton of a plant in the Aleutian Archipelago. It's a sentence I never thought I'd be saying a couple years ago. Along the bottom is time. I went back to 1665, um, and then the most recent specimen had been collected in 2004. And then plotted along the bottom, too, is I show you the number of specimens that's represented at any point in time for that year. So obviously, those long-lived plants don't grow. Uh, there's not as many of them that grow for a very long period in time. So when I go further back in time, I might only have records from one or two plants. So I'm a little bit cautious in interpreting that. And then towards the recent, I have a lot of records. And I kind of feel like if you have one, that's information. If you have two, that's great. If you have three, then you're doing amazing. By the time you're at five, six, seven, OK, we kind of know what's going on here. So I'm going to show you um, a series of data slides. Again, I'm sorry, I'm a scientist. I like data. Um, and I'm going to walk you through kind of a qualitative thought process to think about what has caused temperature to change here. By qualitative, what I mean is, in my paper, there's tons of stats, but stats really are really boring. So I'm just going to kind of walk you through it in descriptive terms. So to start off with, you might have noticed, um, this is my Aleutian record now, um, right here. I've taken away that uncertainty. I've just plotted the average value. Uh, and there's a warming for the last 150 years. And I am very confident that that warming is anthropogenic climate change, um, in part because it matches the warming that we find everywhere else around the globe. So it matches the warming um, that was from this primarily tree ring, although there was other records um, also incorporated, that was published by scientist Mike Mann in Science in 2009. So the rate of warming here is the same for both of them. But you can see the record in the Aleutian temperature is very different before that. So what could be causing that difference? There's not so much of an anthropogenic signal or a human-caused signal in climate prior to the Industrial Revolution. So let's think about our natural factors. Do you remember what they were? So orbital changes, probably not an influence here because of the time scale. But we had our volcanoes. So plotted across the top now, it's from this database with the Smithsonian called the Volcanic Eruption Index. And it is the number of major volcanic eruptions above a certain scale that occurred over that period in time. And if you remember, volcanoes actually cause a cooling. So if volcanoes were driving this temperature, you'd expect to see more volcanoes when it was cooler and less volcanoes when it was warmer, which is not what we see. During this kind of anomalous or kind of unusual warming in the early 1800s here, and then during our trend, it's actually when we have more volcanoes. So what I can say, kind of as a first order, is that the Aleutian temperatures are not really related to volcanic activity on a large scale. We also remember solar activity. The amount of energy coming from the sun um, changes over time, and that can change what our temperature is here. And what, um, one line of evidence to test this in the Aleutian temperature is in the past, there was a period in the northern hemisphere regional cooling called the Little Ice Age. 
there's a doc, um, artistic documentation of this, of people skating on the River Thames. And if anyone's been to England in the past 100 years, the Thames is not really frozen over. Uh, so it was a little bit cooler on average in the Northern Hemisphere. And in part, that was caused because of something called the Maunder Minimum and the Dalton Minimum, when there was reduced solar activity. You can see here, during the Maunder Minimum, temperatures were actually cooler. But then during the Dalton Minimum, that was during this warm period at the early 1800s. So if there's an influence of solar, it's not a consistent influence. And I would say, again, as a first order, solar activity is probably not a big driver on seawater temperatures in the Aleutians. So what is causing it? I don't have a good answer for you. Um, but one thing that we're thinking about is maybe it's because of the ocean. And so this is um, this record along the bottom. First thing to note is it also shows that 150-year warming trend right here. But it was also warm during the early 1800s. And this is from the northern part of the South Pacific, just south of the equator. And the Pacific Ocean has um, these patterns in it that sometimes connect what happens in the north with the south. And so what we're wondering is whether there's some ocean dynamics. Um, but the problem is, there's no other information to really kind of test that theory. So it's just an idea right now until we get more data. Again, the importance of data to be able to test that out. So this gives you an idea of how we can work through the different things that change climate, kind of at a broad scale, to think about how it actually changes temperature. For the last part of this talk, I want to take you somewhere up much further north, much cooler. Um, and this is back to when I was standing on top of the ocean. Um, and this is in northern Canada. It was a community called Kikila Tarak uh, in, in, um, in the Canadian territory of Nunavut. And we went up there in 2015. Um, this is the, the kind of the airport signage for the flights uh, in the Inuit language in Ittitut. Um, it did flash into English every once in a while. And I don't have a picture. This is our flights on the way up there. And I don't have a picture of the way back, but it was all red because our flights were all canceled and we, we were delayed when we were up there. Our reason to going up, this was as we were flying into Kikila Tarak. And if you kind of squint your eyes and look in the middle, you might see that. And these were our scientific collaborators when we were there. It's a French scientist who him with his wife and his two kids over winter in a sailboat. Um, and their kids go to school with the local community. Uh, and so again, this was July, and they were still iced in. Uh, I think they were there after we left for another maybe three weeks until end of July, early August, before they were released from the ice. And they headed over to Greenland for a little bit and then came back. And then they iced in a different community, I think, um, for the following winter. So um, I'm a scuba diver, um, but I'm not crazy. So we hired him to go diving for us. Um, we dug holes in the ice, and then he went down um, through the ice for us. And he's an extremely accomplished um, diver. I, I joke about that. Um, I am a diver. I'm not an extremely accomplished diver, um, and, and he is. So he went down, and he um, collected our algae for us. So we went up there to collect our coral and algae, which are growing under 10 months of seasonal sea ice. So if you already weren't amazed about the power of plants, it was growing under 10 months of seasonal sea ice. The specimens we collected were fairly young. Uh, we only go back about 40 or 50 years with these ones. But because the fieldwork in the Arctic was really slow, uh, we only got, I think, two, three dives in at our good location. So um, we're confident that if we can go back, then we'd be able to find older ones. We're confident they're there. I guess whether we find them or not is another question. So why did we go up to the Arctic to collect the algae? Um, well, in part, is because that's our data gap. But the Arctic is also changing fast. So these are temperatures, anomalies. There's a good word for you. Um, for, Janu for 2016, anomaly is the deviation from normal. So what it is, an anomaly, is it's telling you how temperature is different from the average. So the average here is from 1981 to 2010. You always need to know your reference period. So this shows how temperatures in the year 2016 were different from temperatures um, for the 20-year period of 1981 to 2010. Where it's red, it's warmer. Where it's blue, it's cooler for the year 2016. And what you can see on average, it is a fairly red planet in this case. And it is much redder up in the Arctic. So why is the Arctic warming so fast? Why is it changing so fast? Uh, it's because of that albedo thing that I talked about earlier. Because what color is sea ice and snow? It's really white. So it reflects a lot of the sun's energy. But as you start to warm the temperatures, you start to melt some of that sea ice and snow. And underneath it, under the sea ice, is the dark blue ocean. 
So as you melt the sea ice that reflects a lot of the sunlight, and you expose the dark ocean, which absorbs the sunlight, it then warms up, which melts sea ice, which warms up more, which melts sea ice, which warms up more. And we have this, like, this feedback effect. It's called a positive feedback, where it's kind of a runaway train causing this amplified warming. So the Arctic is changing very, very fast. Why do we care about what's happening in the Arctic? Well, people live there, but also our weather is in large part determined by what happens in the Arctic. Uh, if you think about it, there's a gradient in temperatures um, between the tropics and the poles. And have you ever, um, I don't, I'm not sure if it's so much here, but at least when I was in Canada, you could always tell which way the wind was blowing from in Toronto, because if it was coming from up top down, it was really cold. If it was coming from up here, it's warm. Actually, the other day when we had our little scattering of precipitation, did it rain out here? It did a little bit in Claremont, a little bit. So if you had actually looked at a wind map, the wind was actually coming um, from southeast of us. So some of that moisture might have actually originated in the Gulf of Mexico as part of the southwest monsoon and made its way to us here. Versus in the winter, and that's why it was so hot and humid, versus in the winter when the rain comes from the ocean on top of us, comes this way. So the direction makes a big difference. And there's some thought that if you change the temperature gradient between the tropics and the poles, you're going to really change weather. It's one of the phrases that we're throwing around in our community is weather weirding, or the strange weather. So that's one reason we care about it. The other reason that's really important is because of the other thing that carbon dioxide is doing. So we're putting this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, but really only 40%, half of it stays there. About a quarter, a third of it goes into all the vegetation on land, and about a quarter, a third of it actually goes into the ocean. So this is a record. The red is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This was taken at a station in Hawaii. I feel like it's the best job ever to measure um, atmospheric conditions in Hawaii. The green is carbon dioxide that has dissolved into the seawater. And the blue is seawater pH. So that carbon dioxide that we've been putting into the atmosphere, some of that has been going into the oceans, and it's been changing the chemistry of the oceans. It's been causing a decrease in seawater pH. But the pH actually isn't that important. But what's important is when you change it, when you add the carbon dioxide, you change the pH, you actually change the availability of the carbonate ion. So the reaction, and kind of very broadly, is you take carbon dioxide, you take water, you take carbonate, you put them together, and you end up with bicarbonate, which is different from carbonate. Now, why is carbonate important? Do you remember what those algae made their skeletons out of? Calcium carbonate. What did corals make their skeleton out of? What about shellfish? Yeah, so we are changing the chemistry of the ocean in a way that's going to make it harder for many of these organisms to grow. Maybe. We don't really know. We're trying to figure it out. Well, it's many of them we know. With this algae, we went up there to test how well can this algae grow in conditions that have decreased seawater pH and lower temperatures, warming temperatures, and it's part of this bigger project that we have going on. The question is, this is what this algae looks like in a very... Um, in an environment that it does very well. So not all the way up in the high Arctic, but uh, off the coast of Labrador. But is this what it's going to look like in another 30 or 40 years when you are decreasing the carbonate ion and your warming temperatures? It might shift into an ecosystem that's dominated by different types of organisms. So it's part of this bigger project we have to understand the resilience of this algae. Because as you can see, it's actually covering a lot of the seafloor in some locations. Not many people go to those locations. You don't have a lot of tourism industry the way you do with the tropical corals. But they're still in a very, very important part of our ecosystem, and we don't really know that much about them. So funded by the National Science Foundation, we've been doing a series of experiments to find out how resilient are these algae to changes in seawater pH. Another reason why, just to end up on this, is that it's important, is this is the community that we worked in, Kikilatarak. This was taken, this picture was taken, I think it's about 10 or 11 p.m. at night, it's above the Arctic Circle, so we had 24 hours of daylight. And it's a community with a very rich cultural history, who's under a lot of economic pressure, um, and who's really living at the edge of an environmental, of, um, that people can actually survive at. Um, many of the people that we met here are people that really live on the land, and they're not gonna be able to continue doing that if their food source in the ocean is taken away from them because of environmental changes. So when I think about why I do this, um, in part it's because I have empathy for a lot of other people around the world. In part it's selfish because I want my little kids to have a place to live in the year 2100 
um, when they get to be that age. So I said no more doom and gloom, though, and, and I want to end on an optimistic note, because I really am optimistic. I did decide to have kids, after all. Um, I did decide to be, to study this um, as my profession. And there's two reasons why I'm optimistic, or at least two reasons we can talk about right now. The first one is because I'm a college professor, and the students, and I'm a little bit of self-promotion here, this is my research lab, um, plus two little kids thrown in. Um, this is a, our dinner in the spring. Um, I have them over to my house once a year. Uh, these students are smart, they're engaged, they are go-getters, they're empathetic. Um, they're going to, they're going to, they're up for the challenge. They are on it. They are really, really talented students. Um, we are giving them the skills that they're going to go on um, and they're going to be able to figure it out. Um, I don't want to leave it to them. Um, I'd like to think that we can figure it out, um, but at least we're leaving it in good hands. So the generation of students that I see as students right now are, are really, are really, really great. Um, the other reason, um, just to put it back on us a little bit and to come back to this figure, is if you remember, these are our two scenarios. And the thing is, we're still right in here, right? So this figure is a couple years old now based on data that's a couple years older than that. But we still have the time to make the decisions of which of those pathways we take. So, it's not a decision that anyone else is really making for us. It's a decision that we're making. And I have confidence that eventually, hopefully, people will make a decision to do something about this. And we will be able to do something about this. And we will avoid this worst case scenario. So I'm very optimistic in people. People can be extremely resourceful and extremely productive. Um, and so I think that we're going to figure it out. Um, and part of the reason I do talks with this is to, to share my thoughts on this and to help spread the word so that when we do have the capacity to do something, we do do something, realizing kind of what the situation is and where we are. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Um, I'm glad we have time for questions. And then also, if you can figure out how to spell my first name, you can find me easily online on my email address. Uh, if you try Williams, there's a few of us. Um, but if you can figure out Branwen, I'm pretty much the only one in California, I think. So uh, thank you all. <laughs>
I think we always need to be very clear about how well we know something. Um, I think in the past, sometimes people have said, well, if I know this and I think it's like this, it's been taken as not being confident, um, but I'm very confident that I know this this well. Um, and I think that in the community, we're really moving towards kind of knowing where the problems are um, and testing it, convincing yourself, testing it multiple ways, so changing your algorithm, see what your answer is. And the other thing is, there's a lot of different people who are all running, working with data, and everybody does it a little bit differently. So the importance of diversity is when you have a lot of people from different backgrounds and different perspectives all addressing the question, you all do it a little bit differently, and if you all converge on the same answer, then I get to have more confidence. Where if you all run it a little bit differently or you change something and you get a different answer, um, then you're, you're missing something. You need well, to keep doing the it. Width of the band. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. So the width of the band gets really wide as you go further out, right? It's the same. Um, we're going on a trip soon, and my mother-in-law was talking about weather two weeks out, and I said, well, the forecast is useless. It's no good past ten days. <laughs> so, and even like the ten-day forecast is really not that good. Um, but as you get closer, it gets better and better and better. So I just think that it's it's a real. My cohort of scientists are very cognizant about transparency and about um, really representing like this is our confidence in this and taking that as a thing that we're really proud of um, and not trying to hide anything. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I should yeah, let you handle the. No, no, no. I'm yeah. going to let you come over here and, and Oh, use the microphone. Talk, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, but go ahead, please. Take a couple, couple other questions. OK. Um, do you think the Pacific Decadal Oscillation causes some of the variability in your? Yeah, so um, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, uh, it's one of the things that I, I think about it a lot. I love it. Um, the Pacific Ocean has two things about it. The first thing is it has a spatial pattern, so a pattern with geography in temperature, and it's a horseshoe shape. So the middle of the Northern Pacific Ocean tends to be a different temperature or a different pattern of temperature than around the Northern, Eastern, and Southern part. Did I get my coordinates right? I think I got my coordinates right. Um, and then that changes on something called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation Timescales. It's about a 25 to 30 year pattern that occurs. Um, what I've seen in the Pacific Ocean is, in terms of my record, the squiggles, 1977 was a um, year where a lot of things in the Pacific Ocean aligned. I think that, um, and that was a shift, or that was a, um, a change in the Pacific Decadal Oscillation happened in 1977. Um, and it, you see it in fisheries, you see it in precipitation records on, sh on land, you see it in seawater temperatures. Um, I don't see the Pacific Decadal Oscillation before that so much. But one thing we've noticed is that the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, if you look at the records of it preceding instruments, they all disagree. So what we actually think is that the climate has been changing that way only for 100 years. And the records are all from different locations. So two records from the same location agree, but from different locations they disagree. And so we really think that it is not actually um, a thing in itself, it is actually a bunch of things all have aligned for the instrumental record period. So it really points to the importance of records preceding the instrumental period, um, but also the dynamicism of the climate system. Um, so it's, it's a great question, and uh, we've seen, a, we've been kind of keeping our eye on it. Um, I don't know if you've, anybody heard about the warm blob that was off the coast, or it's been linked to the drought conditions, it's been linked to warmer temperatures. Um, because where warm water is in the Pacific Ocean is really important uh, in terms of global temperature, because the Pacific Ocean is so big. So it's a really important question, and we don't have a great answer yet. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you were showing record of the 1800s um, temperatures in the South Pacific mm -hmm. and comparison, comparison to the Aleutian temperature? Yeah. Um, where did the, where did the uh, temperature records from the Pacific come? Yeah, it's a great question. From tropical corals. So tropical corals can grow for a couple hundred years. There's a couple of really old ones that have gone back, I think, six or seven hundred years. But those tropical corals, it's a, the specific morphology is these mounding corals. And um, they, can, they have a calcium carbonate skeleton. Um, we use a different um, chemical measurement in the corals because they, they are they're animals, they're not plants. Um, but it was from a coral record. So that was warmer diving. Yes, it was warmer diving, yes. Yes, they were onto something, those scientists. Yeah, in the back. The algae you think your research do you think you research? 
Yes, plathomorphum. Can that be maintained in an aquarium as a living specimen? Yeah, so what we actually did with the support of um, NSF, well, I should phrase it first as I tried to keep it living in an aquarium, and it turns out I don't have a green thrum, um, and I prioritize keeping my kids alive and not the algae. So then I brought on a collaborator who has a record for keeping things alive. He's at Northeastern University, which is just outside of Boston, and we grew them in tanks a year and a half ago. Um, and what we did is we did them under different temperatures and under different um, seawater pHs, um, both the prior to an anthrop prior to the human influence, kind of today, what it might be like in 100 years, and then we went for it, and what it might be like in you know 4,000 years, just for fun. So we did we did do it, um, but it's it, they're difficult to grow, um, and also collecting the furthest south they come is um, off the coast of Maine. Um, so I went out and did a collection. I think the water is about 50 degrees Celsius and also not warm, not the tropics. Uh, yep, the back. Yeah. And I know like in the early 200s, they were coming up with those, like, they, were, they were hypothesizing the idea of, of global dimming, a fact that pollution may be masking the effects of global climate change. Yes. Have you seen any? That's because that, I mean, the, the. Well, that's pretty much, yeah, that's what it shows it. It is, it is, yeah, so we're still seeing that, yeah. Um, so some people um, have the idea of, well, let's put more up there to combat temperature, um, but I'm not a fan of that. So when any of these models, as like pollution, say it's cleaned up in certain areas, we've got battle pollution, do you think that any models could potentially show how that might affect an increase in temperature? I haven't seen model data about that. Um, there was a bit of an um, incidental science experiment after 9-11, actually, when they grounded planes. Um, and there was a temperature fluctuation after that. Um, it's unfortunate the circumstances to run that an incidental experiment, um, but they did show that when you ground planes, you change temperature because you don't have the contrails that are left out after airplanes. Um, I haven't looked though for the model data. I'm sure it's out there. I'm just not familiar with it. Yep. I, I'm sorry if you answered this, but how do you determine the age of your samples? Yeah, so with the algae, it's really easy. We just count the growth bands. We've used a couple of other dating methods to confirm it before we go ahead and do that. Um, so at this point, we're very confident they're annual, but there's been a lot of legwork to get to the point to be able to say that with confidence. Um, some of the algae, they live in places where things like to eat them, um, and then it's very obvious that they were eaten, and then they don't have the annual growth bands, and we don't use them. Um, but, and the really long-lived ones, we tend to secondary date them anyway. Just, just to make sure, just to, again, we like to be confident in what we say. Um, but at the first order, they have really nice annual growth bands. We can also actually use the magnesium calcium as temperature, and you can count the annual cycles in temperature. You can identify each winter. So sometimes, as a secondary method, we do actually identify each winter in the temperature signal, and then we look at the growth bands physically on the specimen, and then we put the two of them together. Again, just to like to be sure of what we're saying. How about one more question? Who gets the last? Uh, the, uh, Sorry, I missed that. The grounding of the planes. Right? Yeah. How did that affect the temperature for how long? Um, I don't know how long. I'd have to go back and read what the results were. Um, particles in the atmosphere are tricky um, because it also changes the albedo um, because if you have darker particles or lighter particles or higher up and lower. Um, so I'd have to go back and see what the actual change was and how long it lasted for. It wasn't a very long change because they resumed flying, but there was a hold on flying for a day, I think, afterwards. I think they went up. They went up that day, right? That's what they did. As it, yeah, so, yeah. Because it would have reduced the blocking of the sunlight, letting more sunlight in. So, Dr. Williams, thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Good, good.